We have a full docket tonight, and so as everyone should know by now, we are discussing the 12 disciples of the English Bible. But now I'm going to throw a curve at you and I'm going to start throwing in honorable mentions in order to kind of fill in some of the gaps between the uh, 12 disciples that we have uh, mentioned here. And so as we get started tonight, you'll notice I've got a new player here, but he's an old player. I added him because that's Joseph of Arimathea that we had a, a sort of a, a mock-up of. Of course, nobody was doing uh, portraits of uh, Joseph back in the first century. And so uh, this is what they think he might have looked like. And so we, that, he represents the introduction that we did as we started this series. And then you've got Bede, who was in the 700s. And then you had Alfred the Great last week that was in the 900s, 850 to 900. And so tonight we are going to move on from that uh, beginning of the first thousand years and realize that there was a functioning Church of England, Church of Jesus Christ in England, way back from the first century and all the way through, and not only in England, but on the continent and in the Mediterranean, there was the uh, Church of Jesus Christ that is his bride that has always been since he ascended into heaven. And so there's more to this first thousand years than we're just covering because we're covering just the development of the English Bible in this 14 weeks. And so uh, if we sort of pass through and you go, gosh, that's not much of a church that Christ had in the first thousand years. Uh, it's just that we're trying to focus on the making of the English Bible. So we're going to come then to John Wycliffe. And Wycliffe is how most people in England and here uh, pronounce that person's name. And so this is actually the first representation that we have of a person that um, these are representations of what they think he might have looked like. But um, Wycliffe um, did have uh, some portraiture done. So England has that. Now we're getting up to the 1300s by now, but we're going to back up a little bit as we get started. What is this symbol that is up here. Well, that symbol is the symbol of the Waldensians and of the uh, Piedmont Church back in the 1100s and 1200s. So we want to talk a little bit about the resolve of the Piedmont people. They were in the mountains where this orange uh, figure is here. They were all in the mountains of Italy and France and Switzerland and Germany, that whole area, because that's where they had kind of been squeezed up into by that time. And what this symbol is, is it's a um, sort of a balanced cross. So this represents the cross and the cross of Jesus Christ in the center of everything held together by the fleur-de-lis that we call it, the three-in-one, three-in-one all the way around, going out to all the people and coming to the world through the Holy Spirit represented by the dove here. So that is an official Waldensian symbol that they had back in these days. And so you can see we have the map here of France with Lyon in the sort of the middle that was a, a center for uh, theology and studies uh, before Paris ever became popular. And then down here the Papal States and Rome. So let's move forward from there. 
what you began to see around the year 1000 and coming forward from there was this dichotomy. You had this area that for a thousand years had been struggling but had become the people that believed in freedom under God. And then you had down here starting in the 600s and by the 900s the Muslim caliphate had come all the way up and had taken all of Spain by force and had come and surrounded Constantinople even though it wouldn't be taken for another couple hundred years and they owned the Mediterranean. So this is their symbol. So their whole motto was submission or the sword. And that is what they did to take over all of this area. You would either submit or you would die by the sword. That was it. And so you can sort of see that oh let me let me explain a little bit more about the Muslims. This is a an actual writing that they own up to in the Islamic tradition and this is the uh, flag this today this is the flag of Saudi Arabia which is where he originated from and he actually wrote this and they're actually proud of it whoever fights for the true faith whether he fall or conquer will assuredly receive a glorious reward the sword is the key to heaven and hell. All who draw it in the, cur in the cause of the faith will be rewarded with temporal advantages. Every drop shed of their blood, every peril and hardship endured by them will be registered on high as more meritorious than even fasting and praying. If they fall in battle, their sins will at once be blotted out and they will be transported to paradise there to revel in the eternal pleasures in the arms of black-eyed Horus. And the black-eyed Horus is a beautiful woman. And so um, their idea was that if you died in battle as a martyr in Islam, you would immediately go to paradise and you would get be surrounded by 72 virgins who would do your every wish. And um, so, and Mohammed is the one who said and wrote this. That's the way you get people to go to battle for you and risk their lives. Because uh, to die in, with that kind of faith is a whole lot better than living here um, in, in their eyes. And so uh, this is still their motto. So, what you had was freedom under God up here in the northern areas in much uh, concentration and then submission or the sword down here and now the Pope is caught in the middle. Papal power is getting the squeeze by the vice and they're going what do we do? What do we do? And so the question was, do you go south? Well, they tried that, right, with the Crusades. They went south to try and take Jerusalem back, and they did for 150 years. But this area was so taken by the Muslims that they couldn't overcome it, and all that the Crusades did for the Pope were uh, lost. Now, people will say, now you Christians, you remember the Crusades, and they'll throw that in your face if you ever want to, are seen to be judging anybody else, like the Islamists. And we have to be ready to say, hey, that's not us. We were up here being church. The Pope organized all of that. And true, some people did come down through there that were part of the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church and join those crusades. Even some from England like Richard III. But nevertheless this was a power play and the power kings got into it but the church of Jesus Christ never supported those crusades. So you can just nip that in the bud. They tried that. They failed. 
So the Pope said, okay, then what we need to do is go this way because these people up here preach peace. They won't come up against us with a sword. And we can make them submit. And that's what they did. They went north because south didn't win. And so they took the bride of Christ to task. And they began the great squeeze and of the Lombard church and the Waldensians that we're going to talk about. And so as they marched, many people were hurt. In the AD 500s, we talked a little bit in some of our lecturing about Gregory the Great. He initiated what I call the Power 7 system. And the Power 7 system we're going to talk about in a minute. But Gregory was an Italian nobleman with no knowledge of Hebrew or Greek, only Latin. He made sacerdotalism a sacrament. That's the communion being taken and everything that has to do with uh, coming before God and making your uh, confession before him through a Roman priest. And if the Roman priest was not available or there wasn't one or you didn't go to a Roman priest, then your plea to God was no good. And so it's part of the power system to take over villages, towns, cities, and uh, then Gregory also adopted the veneration of Mary and named her the mother of God. Now, as we're going through this, let's remember, it was five, almost 500 years since Jesus walked the earth. And the church knew nothing of all of these for 500 years until the Bible was finished in about A.D. 100 so for more than 400 years, this had all been going on. And then Gregory comes along and he goes, oh, yes, but as I interpret it, this is what we're going to interpret. Gregory instituted the prayers to saints for the needs of the penitent. He instituted tradition of the papacy equal with scripture as holy. In other words, the scripture was holy, but also any decree of the pope was equally as holy as scripture. And Gregory instituted the concept of purgatory into the church and paying for indulgences in order to exit purgatory. So all of this was brought on 500 years into the time of the church and other things that we'll talk about. So that was the beginning of it. The culmination of the Power 7 system came another 700 years later, growing and growing and growing into this massive, powerful church under another Gregory, Gregory the Ninth, and this is a mosaic of Gregory the Ninth, and it came to where it was to this. The greatest ignoble act was the institution of giving a license for committing sins called an indulgence. And the Catholic Church actually had a list of how much money you could pay the Catholic Church to get out of doing any of this stuff. So you could do that stuff and you could pay the, the Catholic bishop and he would give you a piece of paper called an indulgence and you, if you ever did anything and you were accused of it, you decided to burn your neighbor's barn down and the authorities came to get you uh, you could say, oh, you can't take me. You can't touch me. I've got an indulgence from the Pope. And they would say, oh, that's right. We can't take you. Okay. All right. Sorry we bothered you. And so you can read here, there are a lot of sins there that could be bought off by indulgences. And many, many other sins, lesser sins were bought off by indulgences. So we don't have time to go through all that. But because the Waldensians and the other Christians in the Piedmont would not go along with that, over a million people were slaughtered as heretics in order to take power. If you didn't go along with what the Pope said was equal with Holy Scripture in all of his bulls or decrees, you would be seen as a heretic. 
And over a million more were displaced and their property was confiscated by the Roman church and the aristocracy. And so they would come in, they would go, ah, you people, what do you believe? Well, we don't believe in the papacy and we don't believe in the Pope. Okay, we're going to kill you and take your property and give it to the Pope. And that's the way it worked. <clears throat> so, here's our first honorable mention. The Waldensians. Named after Peter Waldo, who lived in uh, the time period of 1150 to 1200. And he's uh, got a statue in that area to this day with him having the Bible and having the Bible open. And they actually had their own uh, Bible that was from the Vetus Latina, the old Latin Bible as opposed to the Vulgate. Uh, Peter Waldo was a Christian merchant. He wasn't a man of theology, but he had relatives that were theologians, and he got copies of the Bible, and he read it, and he said, this is what we're not supposed to be going with, and not all of these decrees and indulgences and sins of the popes. And so he had high moral standards. He renounced the papacy. This was his big sin. He renounced the papacy, and the Romant Bible, from the original languages and the Vetus Latina, was what they read and they went by as their uh, Bible guide for light. Um, I got an interesting picture here. This is a, a gargoyle that is on the Lyon Cathedral, and it's still there to this very day. And it is, if you can make it out, it's Waldo, Peter Waldo, depicted as with a hollow head. They made on either side hollow, that's this not damaged, that's how they made it. And he's got a hollow head like a madman preaching toward the ignorant outside the church. And so that's what they think of Peter Waldo to this day. So the Romant Italiano Bibles were studied, and this is where we make the nexus, the segue to what we're interested in, were studied by English Lollards and Wycliffe. So Wycliffe got hold of the Bible that they had from the Old Latin and from the original languages of Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and um, were following that in order to have their inspiration to make an English Bible. So, let's do one more honorable mention and then we'll get to Wycliffe. William of Ockham. You, I won't try to read this, um, um, this Italian or Latin, but what it basically is, is he was the... Um, very learned man back on the continent, but he had come as a priest from Great Britain. And he was actually Scottish. And he was the uncle of Braveheart. And he came to Charlemagne's court and he uh, was a great help to Charlemagne in trying to figure out what was the right thing to do as opposed to going along with the papacy. And he actually, William of Ockham, came up with Ockham's Razor. You may know it as O-C-C-A-M-S, if those of you all who have studied it. Ockham's Razor is still what scientists and mathematicians use to this very day and is taught in our universities. The simplest theory that explains all the evidence is the best. That's what he came up with. And so, as you study these days in our universities, they always go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're defying Occam's razor, aren't you? And they discuss that. So, not going with the simplest theory, that explains all the evidence, right? Now, what Occam was is also a Christian. And he said about the church... He said, the reign of Christ expresses itself in the form of a church that is organized but has no infallible authority. 
Remember the Pope said he was the infallible authority and you had to go by him. Either on the part of a Pope or a council and is essentially rather a community of the faithful that has lasted over the centuries and is sure to last for more. So he was an outspoken opponent of the papacy and we still go by his uh, reasoning today under Occam's razor. And he said, basically, now this is the McCormick revised version that I'm sort of uh, uh, coining here. What he meant was just because Pope after Pope has repeated rules with many allegori allegorical stories, the repetition and allegorizing has no logical evidence and therefore need not be followed, was basically what he propounded to the people. Because it was going with the simplest theory that explains all the evidence. So let's get an example of that. There are many examples, but we'll just go with one. The Pope and the bishops and the priests said, because Jesus called her mother and Jesus was a part of the Godhead, Mary is the mother of God. And she can mediate too. After all, Pope whoever in the past said the spiritual son of Peter, the Pope, the spiritual son of Peter, the first Pope, they said, the first apostle said that Mary can intervene for the flock. So see, if you want to have a whole system that says, come, pay your money, light a candle, and pray to Mary, and she can mediate for you before God, going against the New Testament in the Gospels and in Hebrews and in uh, the general epistles, um, you, can, you make up the story. You allegorize it, yeah, meaning to go over the story. You over the story, allegorical. Um, so they sort of make this logic. And um, William of Ockham said, that's not logic. That, you can't do that with something as important as Scripture. So you don't do this. Well, that was the thing they did all the time. So... He said, there's no evidence for the power seven system. Now that's the coin of my phrase. But he said, there's no evidence in the scriptures from the past or the, any of the church fathers for 500 years for Mariology, which is the uh, use of Mary as a mediator, penance, transubstantiation, worship of saints, purgatory, indulgences, or confession. None of that existed in the church for hundreds of years. And none of the fathers talk about that, except the ones that came from Rome. And so, since there's no evidence, that theory cannot be proven and is not logical. So, that's what he said. There's no biblical or apostolic evidence for the power seven in the original languages, in the Vetus Latina or in the writers of the church fathers. And so he was in hot water, but he wasn't down in Italy or in the Piedmont. He was up in Lyon, uh, protected by Charlemagne. So he could get away with it. But the Pope said, we must make up our own evidence. And you can't read the original evidence on pain of death. In other words, we have our Latin Vulgate, this is all we have, and you can't even read that without a priest. It's against the law. And it's against the law to change anything into, from Latin, that we have the Vulgate into any other language. So, now we finally get to Wycliffe. Wycliffe came along in 360 AD and he was called the morning star of the Reformation. He began to translate the scriptures from Latin into English. And he had some of the older documents. And there was a problem. There was a great divide between the Vulgate and the old Latin, the Vetus Latina, and the Hebrew and the Greek. And so he began to take all of that into consideration and translate a Bible by hand. It took an average with a skilled scribe, took an average of 18 months to do a New Testament by hand. And so this was a laborious affair. 
The first handwritten English language Bible manuscripts, manuscripts, hand done, were produced in the 1380s by Wycliffe, an Oxford professor, scholar, and theologian. And it's interesting to me that whenever you get anything done, it's done by guys who used to be Catholic priests and got to read some of the older documents and said, wait a minute, this isn't true. So we got to start a reform movement. It wasn't some yahoo that didn't know anything from anywhere. It was from within their own ranks that said, this is not right and we have to reform the church. The only problem is the church got all of its money and all of its power off of the power seven. They didn't want to change. Wycliffe preached that scripture was the primary basis for all law and government should follow the true Bible. He actually said, this is a Wycliffe quote, the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Hmm, where have I heard that before? <clears throat> he was the first one that said that. He also said it's not necessary to go to either Rome or to Avignon in order to seek a decision from the Pope since the triune God is everywhere and our Pope is Christ. And um, so um, he came up against, now you, you notice either Rome or Avignon, at the time he lived there were three Popes. And two of them were in Avignon, France and one of them was in Rome and they were always fighting each other. Um, and so, you know, Go figure. And he also said the church is the totality of those who are predestined to blessedness. It includes the church triumphant in heaven and the church militant, men on earth. No one who is eternally lost has a part in it. There is one universal church and outside of it there is no salvation. Its head is Christ. No pope may say that he is the head, for he cannot say that he is elect or even a member of the church. Oh, that's bad. The Pope's not going to like that. And all of the system of the power seven is going to come against you if you say stuff like this. Wycliffe aimed to do away with the existing hierarchy and replace it with poor priests who lived in poverty, were bound by no vows had received no formal consecration and preached the gospel to the people. Gospel evangelists. That's what he was all about. The lollard itinerant preachers spread the teachings of Wycliffe. Two by two they went, barefoot, wearing long dark red robes and carrying a staff in the hand. The latter having symbolic reference to their pastoral calling. The bull of Gregory the 11th impressed upon them the name of lollards intended as an opprobrious epithet, but it became to them a name of honor. Even in Wycliffe's time, the Lollards had reached wide circles in England and preached God's law, the Bible, without which no one could be justified. So you get this picture of the Lollards going around. Now the, the Roman Catholic priests wore black robes and they had hoods, and they walked from place to place with hands folded. The Lollards employed a walking stick and had red robes representing the blood of Christ. And so you could tell the difference when they were coming into your town and who they were and what they did. And so this is the explanation of that. Now, Archbishop Arundel in England, down um, in Winchester outside of London said it's a dangerous thing as St. Jerome assures us to translate the Holy Scriptures it being very difficult in a version to keep close to the sense of the inspired writers for by the confession of the same father he had mistaken the meaning of several texts so he's saying Jerome even made mistakes himself when he was taking making the Vulgate from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. And so to let these ignorant people go about saying the word of God and saying it's the word of God, we can't allow that. And so he says, therefore we decree and ordain that from henceforward no unauthorized person shall translate any part of the Holy Scripture into English or any other language under any form of book or treatise. Neither shall any such book, treatise, or version made either in Wycliffe's time or since be read either in whole or in part 
publicly or privately under the penalty of the greater excommunication till the said translation shall be approved either by the bishop of the diocese or a provincial council as occasion shall require. In other words, if our guys approve it, it's approved. If it's not our guys, it cannot be approved and it's against the law to translate it or have it in your possession. And that was in 1408 after um, Wycliffe had begun and the Lollards were passing out gospel tracts. So, speaking of gospel tracts, here's a page from Wycliffe's Wicket, the first gospel tract. What he did was, instead of doing the whole Bible, which took such a long time and it was hard to do and get, get away with it, he would put together what was called the uh, Wycliffe's Wicket. And we'll explain that in a moment. Which was a narrative digest of the whole Bible so that you could understand the whole Bible in a few pages. And then details against the communion as transubstantiation. Well, that is destroys the whole thing. It's like, you ever seen that game where you have a bunch of dominoes or a bunch of blocks of wood that are all stacked up and then somebody try, has to take one out of the middle or one out near the bottom and what ha you know, you're, you're hoping it doesn't all fall apart? Well, getting this out of the way is like taking a big block of wood from the Roman church and pulling it out from the bottom because this is where they start the control in the local church. And so um, this was anathema to the Roman church and the power that was at England at that time. Now, where did this name Wicket come from? This is just extra. This is extra credit if you're writing it down. Um, you had gates in England and they had the big door. And then this was called the wicket door. It's a small, narrow door, kind of like the door we, we kind of uh, have preached about where it's the camel door uh, back in the Mediterranean. This is the wicket door. And the wicket door is a hard door to go through. So what the insinuation is that the belief in this is the narrow door that you go through as opposed to the wide door to hell. And it comes, it's come down to us uh, in the, uh, the form of cricket. Anybody know how to play cricket around here? I don't really know, but I've done a little bit of study at it. What happens is a guy throws a wooden ball at you and you take a bat like this and you whack it and you try to get it to knock down this wicket, these three posts that are sitting on top, uh, on top of them are these little pieces that hold them together just very gently. So if the ball hits those really good, it'll knock like it shows in this picture. And this guy's job is to not let that happen. That's how you make points in cricket. Well, um, you notice that there's very little grass here. It's mostly dirt right under here. And when um, they would play in England, they would get a lot of mud there. And then after it would dry out, it would dry around the bottoms of these. And when it would dry and the ball would come, it would be hard for this, for the ball, unless it was a right on, straight on hit, to knock those down. Well, guess what they call that? A sticky wicket. And that's where we get that saying today. It, these down here were stuck in the mud, and that's a, another reason why we get that saying. They were stuck in the mud and made for a sticky wicket, which is something you didn't want to happen. And that's probably the only thing you're going to take away from this tonight. <clears throat> so, how did Wycliffe get away with doing all of this in England when it was specifically forbidden on pain of death? Well, the queen protected Wycliffe and Queen Anne from Bohemia had a legacy of the Piedmont Christianity in her family. She was Richard's wife and she wouldn't let him touch Wycliffe. Also, the Black Death killed 25% of the population and 45% of the clergy. Why is it so much more for the clergy? 
because the clergy were caring for the dying as opposed to running away. And so <clears throat> Oxford needed priests and also put up with him because of his popularity and being uh, protected by the queen. And he had the documentation from British history with original Greek to back him up that all the other scholars would have known about. And so that's how he got away with it. Well, we're going to finish up by telling about what happened after Wycliffe's death. Wycliffe died in a, na a natural death and was buried in an English church cemetery to rest in peace for 44 years on the exact anniversary of the 44th day of his death. The Roman Catholic post, Martin V, sent people to do something about that. Um, the Council of Rome was called by Pope John XXIII in the year 1412, and the last official act on that council was to order the burning of Wycliffe's writings. This is the same pope who threatened to burn all of his rivals for the papacy if he could but let it lay hands on them. John was eventually deposed by the Council of Constance, followers of the other Pope. And upon his return from running away, he was tried for heresy, simony, schism, and immorality and found guilty on all counts. The eminent English historian Gibbon wrote, the more scandalous charges were suppressed. These were the more scandalous charges. Heresy, simony, because he'd have to be put to death for that. But they let him go because he was only really finally charged and found guilty, uh, the vicar of Christ, uh, for piracy, rape, sodomy, and murder and incest. And so he, they could let him live for that. So that's the guy who was against Wycliffe. Now, he dies, and Martin V comes along, and in 1428, 44 years after Wycliffe's death, Martin commanded that Wycliffe's corpse be exhumed and burned and the ashes cast into the River Swift, which flows through the Lutterworth, then to the Avon, etc. This is a quote from Fox's Book of Martyrs about Wycliffe. And I have here a pole with a burlap bag on it. And what they did was they put, they, they had grave diggers go out. None of the Catholics would touch it. They, they, dug him up, took his bones, put him in a bag, and brought him with a 10-foot pole as standard for putting over the fire and burning it to ashes. And then the ashes were poured into the river. And they took his gravestone and pummeled it and knocked it apart and threw it out in the woods so that no one would ever remember Wycliffe or if they did, they would remember what happened to Wycliffe that might happen to them if they came up against the papacy. And so um, uh, Wycliffe was put to this and that is to this very day why we have that saying, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Well, at least the priests would touch a heretic's ashes with a 10 foot pole. But if you really, really don't want to do something, you'll say, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. And that's where we get that saying. So uh, that's extra credit, by the way. So Next time, we're going to study the very interesting, fascinating story of the fall of Constantinople by Mehmed II and how it segues with our next disciple of the English Bible that you've probably never heard of, Lord Mountjoy. And we'll study that next time. So let's pray together.